Hey, I'm Chris F from Make Everything, and today we're going to be making this blacksmith's guillotine tool. Very cool little tool for a controlled movement of metal. I'm going to show you how I built it and what it does. Let's get into it. All right, so I'm actually starting out this project with a piece of scrap material. This is a half inch base plate for what I think was like an umbrella or something. Funny enough, when I moved into my shop, this was sitting outside in the driveway and I've been trying to think of a project to use it on ever since. And I'm using this because it's half inch thick material and I really didn't have anything else that had this heft in the shop and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to cut it up and use it for something that's definitely going to be more useful than a paperweight. So it's been sitting outside for four years and I cleaned it up with the angle grinder cutting off that stud and now I'm just using a knotted wire wheel, uh, a cupped wire wheel from Fair. These things are super, super effective at getting rust off. I found that these higher quality wire wheels versus like the big box store ones, they shed a lot less material and they just generally work better. Now I made a template for this, but the entire design is based off of a similar guillotine tool that my friend Cliff Dufton makes. You can check him out on Instagram at CJ Dufton. So I essentially took a photo of his guillotine and I drew a similar thing up in SketchUp, printed out a template and I'm tracing it using a paint marker. Now I'm gonna be cutting this out using the plasma torch on my little homemade plasma table collector thing. And what's nice about this is that all the sparks are gonna go down into that sort of funnel into a bucket of water and it's really gonna help contain things and you know keep me working safe while I'm cutting this up. Now I had cleaned off the metal mainly so I'd get a good ground and the paint marker makes it a lot easier to see what you're cutting with the plasma torch. I'm using a Lincoln Tomahawk 1000, which easily cuts through this half inch plate. If you watched my striking anvil video, you saw me cut through one inch plate with this thing. So it handles the half inch, no problem. Now freehand cutting with the plasma torch isn't the easiest thing. Um, you've got a little bit of kerf to worry about, but also just, you know, you're dealing with that super hot arc. You've got to be really careful to stay on your lines and um, this was the first time I'd really have to cut a complex shape like this out of such thick material. When you're cutting sheet metal with a plasma torch, since it's so thin, you can really run through it quickly. But this half inch, I had to take my time, and it was definitely a little more difficult to stay accurate. I cut out each piece, you know, being as careful as I can, knock off some of the slag, and sort of just check my measurements to make sure they're going to be as close to equal as possible. You'll also notice I've got a fume extractor running just to try to keep some of the smoke down. Uh, this is a little Lincoln Mini Flex. It does a really nice job, but I've also got the fans running in my shop because it's just hard to mitigate all the smoke that comes out when you plasma cut, especially when the material's rusty. You got to burn off all that impurity. So after I cut everything out, I bring it back outside and I use my little quick vise and my grinder and I start grinding away to try to make these pieces as symmetrical as possible. Now I want these, you know, to be super flat and square to the bottom of the guillotine tool. So I'm using a Farad Victor grain disc. It's just a super heavy cutting, uh, you know, stock removal disc on this larger size grinder. And it just eats away at the material. It just makes it so easy to get away any imperfections and really make everything even. And by grinding everything as one, I know that when I'm done, everything's going to be nice and parallel and it's going to look nice and clean. Now, this is a quick release vise. And I usually use this on my drill press, but it's really great for doing stuff like this where, you know, you want to just be able to kind of keep things down to the table um, or move things around once they're kind of clamped together. It just uses like a piston. So you, um, you know, like a cam piston. So you push in that lever and then you see that handle with the red knob on it. You flip that over and it grabs on really nice. Now, one of the areas in particular that I wanted to clean up was inside the sort of kind of neck of this C for the guillotine. And I'm using a Farad Polyfan Curve Disc here. And you've seen me use these before on my smaller grinder, but I didn't even realize that they existed for the seven inch grinder. Now this is a, a flap disc that 
has abrasive on the top, front, and bottom of it, so you can get inside curves and grind pretty much all around the edge of that disc and always be effective. It essentially made that way easier than it would have, you know, not having it, and uh, I'm really glad to use those. I've got a couple other pieces to plate to cut up, and right now you see I'm using the strip from the actual plasma table as my cutting guide. What's nice about these is that they're super thin. They're, um, I think there's 3 16th material. So I just use two C clamps and it allows me to run my plasma torch right up against it and make a nice straight cut. And these are gonna be for the faces of the actual um, guide blocks for the guillotine tooling. Now over on the bandsaw, I'm able to cut these down. And what I did just there was I put a round piece of stock in on the other side of my vise, which would just help me grab this sort of uneven material and clamp it well in the vise. Once all those pieces are cut, I go over to the 2x72 grinder and I set up a little stop block so that I can grind everything perfectly square. I deburr everything and make sure everything's nice and trued up before I go back over to the welding bench. Now I also wanted to cut up some of what the tooling material is going to be. Now this is two inch by one inch solid mild steel bar and this is essentially what I'm going to be making all my tooling out of. I got a 14 foot piece from the metal supplier so I can make plenty of pieces of tooling. The bottom die winds up being somewhere around three inches uh, and the top die is around 11 inches and that allows me plenty of room for them to move around and swing. So once I have those other face plates cut, I have to drill them. Now the way this is all gonna be attached is I'm gonna use 7 16 grade eight hardware, and that's gonna be my fastening method. Um, but I've gotta drill holes in these that are gonna definitely register perfectly with one another, and that's really important. So I'm tack welding the plates together before I go ahead and drill them. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark out where I want these holes to be so that I can put one inch blocks on either side of the actual guillotine tooling that's going to swing down. I mark everything out with a punch and then I center punch everything and what I'm going to be drilling with is the size drill bit I need to tap 7 16 bolts um, into this material. So my kind of sequence of events here is by drilling these out with the tap size, I know that when I ream out the hole uh, for the clear size, it's gonna be perfectly registered with the piece below it. So I'm just drilling these out, taking my time, because essentially I'm drilling through one inch of material, using plenty of uh, drilling lubricant as I go, and just sort of taking steps. You can put enough pressure when you're drilling like this to break the weld, so I wanna make sure that I'm really careful. I also don't want anything spinning and binding. And now I'm gonna go ahead and cut the actual sidebars for the guide path for the guillotine tooling. This is one inch by one inch solid square bar. I can use the bandsaw to cut those welds a little bit on the plates that I welded together, and then I can break them apart with a chisel. Now 
I can see the layout here. I've got one inch bar on either side of that two inch thick uh, guillotine tooling. And it's going to essentially create a steel slide for the tooling to move up and down in as a guide. Now, before I move any further, I go over to the bridge port and I use the Tapmatic to tap these half inch plates on the back side with the 7 16 tap. You guys have seen me use these tapping heads before. They're amazing. They save you so much time. I'm able to literally just kind of buzz through these so quickly. They're self-reversing and um, they really save you so much time and energy. You know, your taps are always going to be straight. Your threads are always going to be nice and clean and perfect. They back themselves out and you wind up like never breaking taps. Now I'll go over to the front side of these plates and I'll drill them out to the 7 16 hole that the hardware would be. And on these, I didn't really oversize. I went with 7 16 as the drilling size. Um, I wanted to keep these as tight as possible and I figured if I needed some room for slop, I could always make these holes a little bit bigger as needed. So I wanted to make sure I had just a little bit of space on the sides of my tooling when I welded everything together. So I took a piece of paper, cut out a little strip, and made that as sort of a shim buffer around it. I put in my side guide blocks on the tooling path, and I tacked welded them together once everything was clamped. Now that paper is just going to give me just enough clearance so that things can move freely, but not actually have any slop. Now with those welded together, I can go back over to the drill bit and chase through them with a 7 16 bit, and I don't have to worry about them moving. They're also locked down in the vise. As I drill each hole, I knock in a 7 16 bolt, and this just helps me just in case I, you know, break that weld with all this extra torque and this thing tries to move on me. By putting in these bolts, it's just going to help make sure everything stays nice and well registered. It's really important that this screw orientation stays perfect because my tapped holes on the backside plate are all riding off of this. So if something gets crooked, it's not going to go together and it might bind up. I can do a test assembly and try to slide my tooling through there. And I can see that everything's got a nice little bit of clearance and I can continue on with the rest of the project. Now I'm going for a three inch gap between the two half inch plates. And what's convenient is I can just use some one, two, three blocks that I have kicking around the shop to space everything out. And then I can use a square to see how perpendicular I am to the table with the face of my actual plates. I had a little more material still to remove. So I just went back over to the two by 72 with a 36 grip belt and just did some cleaning up. Did a little chamfering over on the edges as well. Over on the bandsaw, I cut off the ends of those bolts, keeping them nice and flush, and I do a little bit of grinding just to make sure they don't stick out the back so that when I weld it, nothing gets in the way. You can see how I have everything clamped together and I took a piece of that one by two tooling and I stuck it in between the upper and lower guide block just so I made sure I had perfect alignment before I did any welding. I've got those one, two, three blocks clamped flush to the face of the guillotine frame so that I can clamp to those and I'll make sure that everything stays, you know, nice and parallel and I don't want anything to bind up. Um, and keep everything clamped up super tight while I tack it and then go in and weld it.
Now, right here, I got a little jammed up. I thought maybe I had warped the plate because I couldn't get the tooling out. Turns out I just had a little bit of weld spatter on it, so I had to, like, really force my way to get it out of there. But I'm able to go back and finish weld everything. I'm using a Lincoln PowerMig 360 MP. This is a large multi-process machine from Lincoln Electric. It has absolutely no problem welding this half inch material to one inch material or anything like that. I use this tool on my striking anvil project with uh, outer shield flux core wire. Um, this time I'm just using hard wire, but this machine is really amazing. It is an incredible asset to my shop. It'll do MIG, TIG, and stick, and it's a 360 amp machine. Nice size for a production shop or a job shop doing heavier work. I'll put some links down in the description. You can check it out if you're in the market for a new machine. I highly, highly recommend it. So you can see I started welding in my plates. I left my spacers in as best I could to try to alleviate any warping from all the excess heat. But overall, I was able to weld it without any significant issues. I also had to be careful not to weld the back side of those bolts. I don't want to weld those in. I want to be able to take them out in case there's any issues. Now there's a couple of spacers that I wanted to put in in between the frames and one of them was this one inch piece. So this is one inch thick material that fits nice and tight in between the two pieces on the sides. And what I did here was I drilled a couple of holes in it so that I could put some hardware through it and put a post down into the hardy hole of one of my anvils. I again went with 716's hardware here and I'm just using an Allen key bolt this time. One of the things I wanted to make sure was that this thing didn't protrude out of the bottom, but I also wanted a really good opportunity to weld it. So what I did was I recessed it about three eighths of an inch so I could put a weld bead on both sides of it and it would be nice and strong. It also wouldn't get in the way um, when I'm putting this thing down on a, on a surface. I sunk a lot of heat into this piece and I added a lot of steel just because I wanted to, it to be super heavy, really robust and just sort of last forever. This is another little plate and I just had to do a little bit of grinding so I could wedge it in there. This piece is going to live on top and all these pieces are going to help stiffen this whole thing up. Now there's really no strain on the guillotine itself because the top tool floats and it goes through that guide. Um, but I just wanted to make sure this thing stayed nice and sturdy. You know, if it ever gets hit, you know, if you miss the guillotine top tool, you don't want to bend that frame. This is a one by one post that I'm going to be using inside the hardy hole on some of my anvils. Again, I tapped it with the Tapmatic using a 716 tap. And you can see here how it gets installed on the bottom. The multiple holes I drilled on the bottom are helpful because they allow me to put this in a range of the anvils in my shop. I added one more plate on the bottom. This is another piece of one by one and this has a hole in it as well. And this one is specifically so that I can use it on my smaller 160 pound Peter Wright. So now that I've got all these pieces of material welded in there, all my plates are welded in, everything's overdone, if anything, um, this thing isn't going anywhere, I take it back outside onto the table and I start grinding it. Now, I'm really not trying to make this thing look perfect. You know, it's a blacksmithing tool. It's going to get used and abused. But I did want to clean up any of those welds that were sticking out, make everything nice and flush. Anywhere that looked like it might have been uneven, I go through and I clean up. Um, so that it sits flat on the table and so that it looks nice and square when you look at it from the front. Now I go ahead and I take out the bolts and disassemble it so that I can put some finish on it. Now these bolts are probably all slightly different in length so I try to keep track of where they went. And I did decide to add a little holder for the bottom die. So I drilled out and tapped a spot for a 3 8 inch set screw and that's just going to hold the bottom die in place, keep it from bouncing around and potentially bouncing out from the impact from above. I could take the top guide off. And again, like I said, I'm trying to keep these bolts in an orientation where I remember so I can put them back in the exact same spots and everything will thread together well. 
Now for the finish here, I'm gonna be using some Black Magic from Sculpt Nouveau. You've seen me use this before. I love this as a patina and a finish. It's a chemical blackener. It works a little better when the material is hot, but it does work when it's cold and it gives you a really beautiful deep blackening on steel. Now you really wanna to try to get the mill scale off as best you can for a good finish. And on this one, I sort of just scratched the surface, but it did still come out super nice. And by taking the front off, it just you know allowed me to make sure that I got finish all over the entire thing. Now you saw one of those little guide blocks just popped off. You know, it wasn't a big deal. And everything will go back together smooth. Now once that finish is dry, I go back and I put some black wax on it. And the black wax is going to help seal it up. And it's going to help protect it from, you know, any corrosion um, or, you know, getting any rust. The black wax goes on just like a Johnson's Paste Wax, but it just adds another layer of depth to that blackened color. I let the black wax dry, and then I go back and I, you know, kind of brush it in with a rag. I put the bolts back in to reassemble the whole piece. I also threw a little bit of wax on the top tools for all the guillotine tooling so that it would slide a little bit better through the guide. Now you can see I added my little post to the furthest back uh, hole and you can see how nicely it sits on my lightweight Peter Wright anvil. This is like a 150 pound anvil and in the background I've got a 400 pound fisher that I've also you know positioned a hole so that I can put a hardy shank in there and I'll be able to push this thing down. And now you can see I'm able to change it and move it up to the front and I can use it in my striking anvil that I just built. Now before we give it a try, I wanted to make another piece of tooling and a couple other different styles. So here's just that one inch by two inch bar and I'm gonna kind of run through making a couple of pieces of tooling. First thing I make is sort of a set of butchering dies. These are a pretty extreme, you know, it's a 45 degree angle and these things are gonna be nice and sharp. They'll be good for making like a really acute and kind of pointed angle. Um, and the other thing I wanted to try was making this sort of like ball fuller. So I took two other pieces of the die material, marked out the dead center, and then I'm going to drill some holes and I'm going to put in some one inch solid hardened steel ball bearings. I use a spotting drill bit to kind of give me like a nice little heavy chamfer. And then I go back with a really large countersink and I push that into the material to give a nice area for a one inch ball bearing to sit in so that there's a little bit more penetration for me to get to it with the welder. I do this to both the top and the bottom die. And um, again, any of these tool pieces of tooling can be used in any combination with something else. So if I wanted to just dimple the top piece of a material, I could put a square die in the bottom and a round die in the top, and I could use it like that or vice versa. So it's a really versatile tool, especially when you make all the tooling out of the same material, you can really mix and match. Now a little trick here, I'm just using a clamp with a bolt on top to hold down that ball bearing um, and keep it flat. The hole in the nut acts as like a little kind of universal guide and it keeps that ball from rolling around and it's a little easier to grab than the top of it with the clamp. I tack this in and then I weld all the way around it so it doesn't move. Now the other little piece of tooling I wanted to make um, we're, you know, with these two pieces of three eighths bar. Now I weld these over to either side and I weld these over to either side and I make sure that they're nice and flat and square. And these are going to give me sort of like a, a little fluted sort of effect when I go to actually hammer them into some hot material. Again, I throw a clamp on there, make sure everything's nice and tight and parallel. Now, again, I want these to be perfectly lined up with one another so that as I'm kind of hammering around a piece of material, they're giving me a consistent effect.
Now, eventually, I'll probably find myself making some tooling out of a hardened material. Right now, all the tooling that I made is out of mild steel. But from the test that I did, and you'll see in a second, everything held up really well as long as the material that I was hitting was nice and hot. Maybe eventually I'll get my hands on some harder material or something that I can heat treat and the stuff will last even better. So now over on the striking anvil, I'm going to give this a try. I was out of propane, so I decided to just sort of try this out with my rosebud on my torch. We'll start out with the butchering dies. And with these, I noticed that it was a little hard for me to kind of keep things even. Um, I was tilting the material, which was causing the dies to kind of meet in an uneven spot. But it still did a really quick job of adding this sort of harsh shelf into the material. And I'm grabbing a three-quarter inch round bar. Now you can see by loosening that set screw in the bottom, I can switch the dies out for the flat dies and do a little work with these. I also wanted to show you this little thing from Harris. This is a gas saver. And what you're seeing me do here is I can pick up my rosebud and then put it down on that hook and it automatically turn off the gas while preserving my settings. You can see the way the little ball tool works. And now this one's my favorite, this sort of double flute. Now this one really gives a cool effect. You can see the way those two pieces of bar imprint. And as I rotate the piece, they leave this really, really beautiful sort of fluting um, that would work really nicely on a punch or you know on the handle of something decorative you could get this nice effect and you obviously could change this with the size bars that you use or anything like that the other set of dies I made were um, these you know a little more mild of an angle a little less aggressive and um, I figured these would make a nice effect around a piece of bar and you know funny enough they were so effective that I didn't even realize I was about to chop through and I wound up using them as kind of a cutoff but look at that nice perfect chamfer they left in a really nice like as forged finished on that little piece all right that about does it for this video i'm really excited to have this thing um i'm gonna make a bunch of different dies for it these are like i guess you call them butchering dies with this 45 degree opposing angle um the project i have coming up with this you'll have to wait and see what it is but it requires a lot of really controlled hammer strikes on the top and the bottom of the piece. Now, if I didn't have this, I would have to use a hardy tool and then a top tool and then strike the top tool. So I'd have three things to hold. I'd have the work piece, the top tool, um, and the hammer. And with this, all I have to hold is the work piece and the hammer, strike this top plate. Obviously, these things come right out. Um, so I got the design of this, the basic design from my friend Cliff Dufton. Now, if you're interested in getting something like this, I'm not going to make any more of these. This was a ton of work, even though I'm happy with how it came out. But Cliff makes and sells these. His are beautiful, laser cut, and absolutely worth the money to invest in. So hit up Cliff Dufton. Here's his Instagram right here. You can check him out, send him a message, and order one of these or something like it for yourself. He's done amazing work with his, and that's what inspired me to build this. And that's what's so great about this community is that after seeing what he did with his, I immediately got ideas on a project that I could do if I had one of my own, got in the shop, cut it out, and built one. So uh, I like to try to keep things, you know, always moving and always looking at the next project. And this is the kind of thing that I'm going to have forever because it's built like a tank and it's going to help me do projects moving forward. I'm sure I'm going to find a ton of ways to use this that I never even thought of now that I have it. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Give it a thumbs up if you did and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this, more videos in the shop and stay tuned to see what I'm going to do with this and the project that I really made this for. If you want to see what I'm doing behind the scenes, you can follow me here on Instagram at Make Everything Shop. I post every day. I posted a build along as I did this. And if you're interested in a little bit of shop talk with me and my friends Derek from Malden and Paul Pinto, we've got a podcast called The Handmade Podcast up on the Makery Network. We're putting out episodes every Wednesday. We've got a few episodes up already, and you can check them out. There'll be a link down below. Follow that Instagram here, at The Handmade Podcast. It's a lot of fun. Just three guys kind of talking about our businesses, how we go about our, our weeks in the shop, what we're up to, and all the other stuff in between. So thank you so much for watching. Again, I'm Chris Zett from Make Everything. I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you on the next video.